This program is exceptionally important to the Dole Institute. Senator Bob Dole was instrumental in the construction of the World War II Memorial, and it isn't well known, but every Saturday that he possibly can, he greets guests from the honor flights at the memorial at 89 years old. He'll be 89 in July. It's an integral part of our mission to honor the men and women who have served America and our armed forces, so it's a special treat tonight. I told Senator Dole about our program. He asked me to thank our special guests for attending and being part of tonight's program, and he also asked me to do one more thing, gentlemen. Thank you for your service. Let's thank the gentlemen for, our, for their service. When I learned that our interviewer tonight was doing an oral history program, I thought what a wonderful program that would make, and I am so delighted that she agreed to run it. It's my honor now to present her boss, the University of Kansas Dean of Libraries, Dr. Lorraine Herricombe. Dr. Herricombe. Good evening. It is absolutely wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. My name is Lorraine Harricom. I am indeed the Dean of the Libraries here at KU. And ever since I knew about this program, I've had goosebumps. I couldn't wait. I could not wait to get here and to listen to your story. So it's a very, very special event for the libraries as well. It's a wonderful night, and I'm so pleased to be here at the Dole Institute for politics to hear the stories and honor the service and contributions of our esteemed panelists. We at the libraries are honoring this generation who served by preserving their stories, experiences, and wisdom for future generations. That work documents the, experiment, the experiences of African-American World War II veterans in Kansas and provide a unique glimpse into African-American history. Those efforts and tonight's event were made possible thanks to very generous funding by Dr. Sandra Gott, as Bill mentioned. The program, in fact, was created in honor of her father, as Bill mentioned, and all African-American World War II veterans. I have the pleasure of having Sandra also on the Library Advocates Board. So thank you again, Sandra, for making this possible. Let's thank her again. Tonight's program is also made possible by a collaboration between KU Libraries and the Dole Institute for Politics. It's my pleasure to introduce Deborah Dandridge, who will moderate the panel discussion tonight. Deborah is the field curator of the African Americans Experience Collection in the Kenneth Spencer Research Library on main campus, and her work has been vital and essential to the task of preserving the history we will hear about tonight. Deborah received her undergraduate degree from Washburn University in Topeka and her master's from Atlanta University and completed her comprehensive exams in history here at KU. She has served on the history faculty of Washburn University and is an instructor here at KU. In the publication, Kansas Revisited Historical Images and Perspective, Deborah and Professor William Tuttle, who's here tonight, wrote the essay Against the Odds, A History of African Americans in Kansas. She's also proudly the 2008 recipient of one of our highest honors in the library, the Budic Distinguished Librarian Award. Please join me in welcoming Deborah Dandridge. When President Roosevelt announced we were supporting the Allied forces for the purpose of defending freedom, it captured the vision and hope African Americans always had for our nation. For more than 300 years, people of African descent had struggled to make their native land live up to its creed of freedom and equality for all its citizenry. And for them, World War II was a two-pronged battle one against Hitler and fascism abroad, and the other against our nation's, per, nation's pernicious color line, commonly referred to as Jim Crow. The Kansas region made important contributions to the nation's war effort. One of those was Bishop John Gregg, 
who served as an envoy to our nation's African-American troops abroad. His popularity and rec was highly recognized throughout the world. The Kerford Quarry Company, established in, in Atchison, Kansas in the 1880s, leased one of its excavated mines to the U.S. government for use as a natural storage. Also, their grandson, Lloyd Kerford, Jr., served in World War II as well. Cornelius Coffey, one of our nation's pioneer, African-American pioneers of aviation, graduated from Capitol High School in Omaha, Nebraska, and later moved to Chicago where he established a school, and he was one of the founders of the National Negro Airmen Association, which opposed segregated training, but they provided during the World War II many of the African-American pilots that were trained. Members of the Negro Newspaper Publishers Association traveled abroad to review African-American troops overseas, and they reported in the radio and as well as in print uh, what the conditions were that our African-American troops were facing. In the center is Dowdell Davis. He was the business manager of the call and president of the association in 1944. But it was those men and women who served in World War II's U.S. military who demonstrated a level of patriotism and devotion to our nation's ideals that made them among the most distinguished of our greatest generation. The military's Jim Crow policies placed severe limits on their participation. They had to meet higher intelligence test scores than whites. They had to be crowded in or be accepted in facilities that were only available to them. They were often rejected because of hostility in the, in the uh, civilian community. Housing was always a problem. No black officer could hold a position higher than a white officer in these sable units. Hospitals were segregated. Blood was segregated. They were delayed in moving overseas, and they kept moving them around on, on, on stateside. But despite all of these obstacles, these soldiers and officers succeeded in making important contributions to the war. They served in every branch, every battle, and more than a million served large. It's the largest since, all, since the American Revolution of the number of African Americans who served in war. Benjamin O. Davis became the nation's first black general in 1940. In 1941, the Army activated its first black tank unit, the 758th. Uh, established the first Ar Army Air Force pilot training, of course, Tus Tuskegee, and the units like the Red Ball Express dr had drivers that, that were well known for their dangerous feats. Uh, also, we had, for the first time, African-American women being accepted into the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps. Consequently, no story of World War II is complete without the record of the, their contribution of African Americans to the war effort. It's not been until very recently, however, that their contributions and even involvement have been recognized in the World War II story for the United States. And it's been so recent to the point where it, well, it took a grant from one of the military units to give to Shaw University in North Carolina to study how how many people had, how many soldiers had been overlooked in giving their Medal of Honor and giving, uh, being awarded their Medal of Honor? And they found out and they began doing it, of course, under the, under the Clinton administration in 1997. So to ensure that this World War II experience becomes a part of the permanent historical record, particularly of the Kansas region, we established with the support of, of Sandra Gott and her, her um, pushing it as well, the Double V Campaign Oral History Project. The Double V Campaign uh, History Project is one that is in the making. It's not complete. We've just begun. We're in various stages of, of its development. So our presentation tonight will be rather, it'll be uh, not as systematic as it probably would if we had completely finished it. As we have said, like so many World War II veterans, Sandra father, Sandra's father, Thaddeus Wayne, married right before he was drafted in 1942. Here he is with his lovely wife, Mrs. Alice Hunley, who was as sophisticated as they could be. Uh, a lovely woman. I had an opportunity to meet her. Uh, and we'll find that um, after the war, um, 
Mr. Wayne acquired his master's degree in guidance counseling from Washington University in St. Louis, and he taught in the Kirkwood School District in Missouri for 36 years before retiring in 1977. It's the photographs in the, in the Wayne family collection that give us a rich documentation of a perspective of the kinds of experiences African American soldiers had overseas. He uh, will notice that uh, Mr. Uh, Wayne earned award, was awarded four bronze store, stars uh, during, his, um, during his stay overseas. We'll find that tonight what we'll do is we'll begin to hear clips from some of the interviewees um, and we'll begin to hear their stories. And we'll start out with three of the people who could not be here. Uh, one is ill, one has recently passed, and one is also ill. So uh, we're getting close to our time. The first person we're going to uh, hear from is Leroy Rolfe who currently resides in Wichita, Kansas, and he was awarded the Purple uh, Heart for his duty uh, as a part of the 92nd Division. And here, here is a part of the story that he tells of how he got injured and the, some of the things they had to do. And his getting into the Army, so we're just short clips. I was uh, living in Arkansas, in western Arkansas, and. Uh, I was a farmer. I was a kid waking from my father on the farm. I was in the 371st Regiment. We was uh, riflemen, machine guns, and mortarmen. The chaplain had service with us. And I remember him uh, speaking that morning to us. He told us that we was well trained and uh, we had the best weapons in the nation and said we was going up the location of 88 Highway, Purple Heart Valley. And he said, uh, some of you will come back, but uh, I'm sorry, but some of you won't come back. Our orders were, don't shoot unless you have to. One night when I got, when I got hit, first time I got hit, I was on a patrol. And I noticed, first thing, uh, they went to shooting a, a flare. The Germans had a flare when they shoot it up. It opened up a parachute. And the light come on, it opened up a parachute, and it'll parachute down easy. But fortunately, this parachute didn't open up. It just flooded. And I said, oh my gosh, these guys see us. And I was trying to decide whether to get out. And by the time I got out, the bullets is hitting all around. <laughs> It was tied up that water. Every time I raised my head up, I had to raise my head up. They had stopped. And finally, a shell fell out to the side of me, and it burst it, and the product was hitting me in the leg. And that got me warm. It hurt, but it got me warm. And uh, again, uh, they kept on uh, searching, dropping the shell, and some more product was hitting me in the head. And by that time, that hurt. That really hurt. And I, that water had been washing me out, and I'd crawl back, washing me out to the water bank, I'd crawl back. And so by the time that I got hit in the head, a leader come crawling back, saying, is everybody all right? Let's go back. We can't go no further. By that time, I hobbled to the Jeep. And when I got in the Jeep, they taken off. When they got loaded, they taken off. But the Jeeps don't have no top to them. Winter time, snow, wind blowing, and I had to go about four or five miles. <laughs> and when I got to uh, the company headquarters, I was nothing but ice. And by 9 or 10 o'clock the next night, I got to a field hospital. That they had big hospital, tent hospital way back, miles way back. And I got to them. All I know is pulling me out of the ambulance and I sleep. Next morning, uh, the uh, Red Cross lady came in and asked me why did I want to send my purple heart. I said, oh, did I want to keep it? I said, no, I don't want to keep it because I can, you know, I can keep it. Mr. Merrill Ross, uh, who has recently passed, 
um, got his training at Tuskegee in 1944. He came from Flat Lake, um, Kentucky, and he came to Kansas eventually um, and got his MA from Pittsburgh State as, as well as his BA. When he moved to Topeka, that's when he got drafted, and he got drafted for a teaching uh, just before he got his teaching appointment. Um, Mr. Ross uh, had donated many years ago his, uh, some of his photographs uh, with his experience in, um, at, at Tuskegee and through the training program. And here are some of the photos, and he's, uh, he's sitting, he's one of those kneeling down uh, looking at. Well, I'll begin with when I first met Merrill. He was out of the service. He was a former Tuskegee Airman in one of the last classes, so he wasn't, he didn't go overseas. So they were told that so many would be washed out at different periods, which was very unfortunate. Um, Merrill finally made it. There were nine in his class of, of 90 that made it, and he was one of the nine. But those who were over there made such a, a name and a, such a good record uh, that some of it is just beginning to come out. Um, they used to call them the red tails because they're airplane tails were painted red and when they would go on these missions to protect the bombers whose pilots and crew were uh, Caucasian because there was no integration at that time during World War II. Another interviewee uh, was Dr. Frederick C. Temple who was a native Kansan who currently and has re resided in Baton Rouge, Louisiana for the last half century. And he was a teacher of the economics department at Southern University. His, he was drafted in 1943, and um, his father, uh, John Temple, and their collection is with us, uh, the, both papers and photographs. His father, who is on the uh, left, served in the Spanish-American War. His grandson uh, has completed uh, two tours in Iraq, and that's a picture of him in the middle on, on your left or right, and the other one is another picture of World War, of World War I troops. And here he will begin partially telling some of his story. And while in North Africa, we served as a MP, with an MP unit. From North Africa, we uh, went to Naples, Italy. I, uh, was in a uh, military unit there, it was the 743rd there. And of course we did patrol duty there and so forth. One incident, I applied for uh, combat and that was for the invasion of Europe. And they were seeking out soldiers that were willing to go in and help on that. And I uh, was looking forward to it. And in a few weeks I received a letter and opened it thinking this was it, but the letter mentioned that they regretted that there were no facilities for the training of colored troops in this theater. And uh, it was just kind of hard to think here, I was fighting for freedom and rights and so forth, and, but uh, I was not good enough to go up and uh, help in the uh, part of the combat. Well, what was your attitude toward the closing possibility of the war? What did you feel about it? Well, I think we were all glad that uh, I think we had seen enough action, although we wanted all this action at one time. And uh, I think that we uh, were glad to actually uh, see it over. And uh, I think, too, it meant a lot to us because, after all, that we fought in that war, I mean, for as a black soldier. Mm -hmm. And they gave and left a lot of lives over there black soldiers there, and I don't think that, and I think while they were fighting, some of them said that America's going to be different too, that we are not over here fighting for nothing either there. And on the way, as a matter of fact, you uh, uh, heard that that was brought out too on the way, look, I fought in, I mean, it looked like it, it did something to, uh, to strengthen, I don't know what it was, but it was a different feeling. 
And I know I had a different feeling too at the time, though. That, uh, in, in other words, uh, uh, segregation wasn't. You just believed it, it. It couldn't last. I mean, it was that here we went over and we fought and all. And uh, what did we fight for otherwise? And not for freedom. I mean, for everyone. And too, I mean, and 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 you found when you got overseas that they would want to know how the Americana, but you know that you found in some foreign countries that they thought, especially the English, that uh, how we had this system to go through and all that. That, uh, so, uh, in other words, I, I'm pretty sure that there was a, that, that there was a different uh, uh, feeling on us that uh, after you go through that. We will now have our gentlemen who have honored us th this evening by being here to come up on stage and we'll play and the format that we'll use for the audience, what we're going to do is we're going to again play excerpts from their interviews and later after everyone is completed, you can feel free to ask questions of each of them. The first person that we will be hearing from is Mr. Harry Gumby. This is Mr. Harry, you don't have, this is Mr. Harry Gumby. He served as Chief, Chief Master Sergeant for the U.S. Army Air Corps. One of the things that we were raised up to, uh, you know, up until I was 19, you know, I had never really been out the state of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. You know, it was that kind of thing. We were just home, home people. Uh, the war, when it came, World War II, you know, I guess uh, made a lot of us, took us away from the domestic scene mm -hmm. and the drudgery of working in somebody's kitchen or on somebody's farm and, and we got to get out and get in, in industry mm -hmm. and do some things and see some things that otherwise probably wouldn't have happened. The first time I paid attention to the war was on December the 7th. Oh, I knew about Hawaii mm -hmm. and um, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, I was pretty good at, uh, at geography and that sort of stuff. And, and I knew, you know, that the war was raging and all that, but it hadn't really touched us. Uh, very few of the people around the little town where I was had gone to war until, uh, to the army, until, of course, uh, 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 we were attacked by the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Then it broke wide open. Well, they didn't, they, they never wanted us to go to war. Mm -hmm. they, did, they never wanted any of us boys to go to the army. They felt it was a white man's war and that we had no business fighting. Dad used to say, you know, just to remember your training, and, uh, uh, and he says, uh, you know, you have sort of a temper. He says, you can't, you got to control that now. Uh, I said, yeah, Dad, I will, and all this kind of thing. And he said, uh, he said don't, don't, don't ever do anything that would make us ashamed of you. Mm -hmm. And I remember that. I received my training in, in Camp Pickett, Virginia. Camp Pickett, Virginia. And I was trained by, uh, in, the, in, the, in the company that I was trained in was white officers and black non-commissioned officers. You really had to watch out there. You had to, you had to be careful there because the officers were mostly from the South, and uh, uh, they treated us just like they had uh, treated the Southern people that they grew up to. The culture was they were in charge, and uh, they were here and we were there. By the time I had finished, basic training. Now this is how much I learned about the Army. They had a book of instructions there called the ARD, the Army Regulation Directives. Mm -hmm. I knew half of that book and could recite it. Well, it so happened that um, the non-commissioned officers were fellows who had came out of uh, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, and they were the Buffalo Soldiers, 9th and 10th, and uh, their, their, their 
they ate and slept and walked soldiery. It was a, a vocation, just like you were a teacher or whatever you were. That's what each one. They were just died in the wool soldiers. And uh, uh, they were impressed that I was able to learn the Army regulations so fast that I took the time to do that. But what they didn't know is I'm, I'm trying all I can to get away from the humdrum. Our next uh, distinguished guest is Major Harvey Bayless. He served in the U.S. Army Air Corps. He uh, received, was one of the four African-American enlisted men to receive a field commission in, during World War II. He also served in Korea, and after leaving active duty in 1953, he was assigned to the Air Force Reserves. In 2007, he received the Congressional Gold Medal for Outstanding Military Service for his service as a Tuskegee Airman. And most significantly, he is the historian for Heart of America chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen. And I want to also give thanks to um, the Tuskegee Heart of, Heart of America chapter for supporting and providing potential interviewees for this project. It's Mr. Parts of Mr. Major Bayless's story. I was drafted in the military in uh, May of 1943. At that time, I was working as a radar mechanic in Boston, Massachusetts. When they set up the 332nd Fighter Group, mm -hmm. they also established the 96th Service Group. The Air Force says we do not want black, we do not want white enlisted men servicing the planes. So with four fighter squadrons and a group, they decided to set up a service group. We, we were notified uh, around the 15th of October, around the middle of October, that we would be going overseas. At that time, the problem was the Air Force was having trouble trying to place this group. At one time, they were going to take the 332nd Fighter Group and move it to Brazil. We ended up going to Africa with the, with the 99th Fighter Squadron. And then after that, it was, the, the group came along later, and it joined the 99th when they had moved into, uh, into Italy. Our next guest is Mr. John Adams who served as second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Corps. Uh, Mr. Adams is someone who was a graduate of, of Sumner High School, and here he is at second lieutenant. Is he cool or what? And he's bad. And before he left, uh, before he got drafted, this is the automobile he had to leave behind. I was accepted to go to Tuskegee where I took a mental, physical, academic aptitude test and passed those and got a chance to be sent to Tuskegee to be a part of the flying program. Well, we started off by going down to the uh, Moton Field. Uh, you were introduced to a, an instructor, and those were mostly blacks that I remember, mine was, took me up in a Piper Cub, and my first, first flight was successful enough with my instructor that we went from the Piper Cub to the lower basic. I guess my size and, and being able to pass the test for, for, for the uh, single engine fighters, I was trained as a fighter pilot. Graduated in 1945 as class 45C, got my commission as a second lieutenant and uh, went from there to, uh, let's see, Eglin Field, Florida for gunnery training in Godman Field, Kentucky for other training, uh, Walterboro, South Carolina for additional training where they found out that uh, we were getting ready to be shipped overseas to replace some of the, the pilots returning from the old 99th group. And then if the war ended, they had an excess of pilots, <laughs> navigators, and bombardiers. Our next guest is Mr. Charles Ellington who 
uh, became corporal in the U.S. Army Air Corps with the, and with the Tuskegee Airmen Support Group. We do not have a clip, so we will ask Mr. Ellington a question. And that is, you, after receiving your basic training in, the, in camp at, in Missouri, you served stateside and you started out in radio training. How did that, ha get, how did that happen to get you into the U.S. Army Air Corps? Well, I think it happened because I, if it's first uh, before I went in, I took examination for aviation cadet. I wanted to fly airplanes. I didn't get a chance to do that, so they, so they, uh, I let them know that's what I wanted I wanted to do when I was drafted. So, but anyway, uh, they they sent me to uh, uh, basic training camp. Uh, after basic training, they sent me to another camp camp to where they uh, uh, found out that I had an aptitude for, for hearing different sounds in my ears, like a radio, like the radio uh, training. So they, they, uh, they uh, thought that was a good, good for me to, 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 to do that. So they sent me to uh, camp, uh, let's see, they sent me to uh, oh, another air base, they sent me to uh, Daniel Field, Georgia. Okay. So I could get some. I should get trained for uh, in a, as, a, as a radio operator. And uh, so that's, that's how, how you, I got started. Right. Well, we appreciate it. and we'll and more of his story as soon as we get finished with the transcription will be there. Uh, this is Corporal Ellington uh, with his 387 Service Squadron. Uh, he is standing on the. Uh, he's standing up on the left, as you can see. Our next guest is Mr. William Tarleton, who served in the 331st Infantry. Uh, he is a native of Topeka, Kansas. Uh, he was awarded in 1943 a Bronze Star for his duty as combat, as in combat infantry. Uh, he, he received a letter uh, from, his com from one of the commanders saying, a letter to uh, his his father saying, "Quote: Your son has clearly demonstrated the clear the excellent soldierly qualities, which are in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service." And it was signed by Colonel Norstein. And uh, for this, uh, many times, uh, Mr. Tarleton was wounded. When Mr. Tarleton returned to the states in 1947. He really experienced the military's effort to desegregate the mil uh, to desegregate uh, the military. So it, it, that, in particular, he, he experienced that transition with his own unit, and he was on his way to the uh, uh, boat to the Pacific when uh, the item bomb was dropped. When I got shrapnel wounds in my arm and, and back, we was getting close to the end of the war, and we was up at to. Uh, uh, in a, B a British Signal Corps outfit. I remained over there for until they, the, when the Germans surrendered, when the Germans surrendered, and uh, we brought them out of the mountains, escorted them out of the mountains, and down to, to the point where the, for prisoner, to imprison them. Well, they had, a, they had, they built stockades in the fenced in areas. And, and the Germans had already surrendered, so we weren't afraid of anything. So went up, got them, and we reported to this colonel. And he was from, he had been trained, I mean, he, he went to school at Boston University. He was a colonel in the, not the Army. He was a nice guy. Oh, you know, that was the other thing, too. We really didn't try to make friends. Oh, and you, you get attached to somebody and, you, and they get killed. That would just break your heart, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just didn't. Uh, I didn't know it. I didn't get close to anybody, and nobody got close to me. So that was the way it was. Yeah, I was working, <clears throat> knowing that I was going to be drafted uh, from Washington State, Seattle. Uh, because I was working there at the Bremerton shipyard. And uh, so I was just drafted in the service and 
was uh, sent to Fort Huachuca, Arizona for basic training. I trained, trained with the 780 military, combat military police. Some of my military training was a continuation of my uh, Boy Scout training. The uh, soldiers who didn't have the Boy Scout training were sometimes uh, couldn't handle certain situations that uh, we were uh, taught. Sometimes they ate sea rations and uh, I would cook a complete meal because I knew <laughs> from Boy Scouts how to find certain things, you know, dig up a potato somewhere and find somebody's chicken and <laughs> and <laughs> bury it in a in the coals in the ground and I've got a perfect meal. The reason that they were taking everybody for the Battle of the Bulge at that time is because they needed people up there and they started taking blacks. But normally, no, they, they didn't uh, take us in those outfits. When I uh, went into, when I was drafted into the service, they asked me what I wanted to be. I said, well, preferably, uh, I want to go into the Air Force. But then I said, well, okay, I can't get that. I want to go into the tank corps. No, you can't do that. Most of the tank corps were white, but they did have a black tank corps, which was very famous in Italy. Senator U.L. Gooch um, served in the Kansas State Senate from 1993 to 2003. He came to Wichita, Kansas um, in the 1950s, and he, oh, he established himself there and established a very prominent aviation business. And he served on the Wichita Council as well. Uh, Senator, Senator Gooch has written a story about his life experiences in which he was able to fulfill his dream, not in the military, but after the war, of being one of the more prominent aviators in the nation. And here he is telling some of his Hindsight is looking back upon his experience in World War II. I think one of the things that uh, I had had in my early bringing up was to be appreciative of somewhat of the little things. And uh, segregating as bad as it was, uh, this country was the best that I knew of. Uh, and this, uh, someone is going to do something bad to this life that we have in this country. I felt like it uh, was important. All the time you're thinking about your country, and then when you got back and you started getting into the conditions that pointed out to you that this really isn't your country, you know, you know to the extent that you're welcome where, everywhere. And that went from thing, other things started happening in my life that some of them that I got into. Well, there's so many things that I look at, uh, uh, you know, I think about the fact that I turned out to be what I, you know, what I know was a hell of a good pilot and I uh, didn't get a chance to do it for the military. And I, I proved that if I had I had that opportunity, I would have. My idea of uh, trying to survive, you know, I, I got, had to learn uh, a lot about how to survive in, uh, in a country that you had fought for, thinking that you would have an equal opportunity to succeed. And even after that, even though you didn't get to do what you w would have preferred doing, you, den you denied doing what you wanted to do while you're there, but you did what you had to do because that was your duty. But now you're back, 
and uh, you're still being denied of the opportunity to do uh, succeed in a way that uh, is uh, your interest, you know, continues to, that continues to face you. This is a war we got to fight for our country, and we're going to win it together. I think if we'd have fought together in that war, we'd have come out of that war more of a united group. I think there's a lot lost because the decision wasn't made. This was a fight for our country, and we're going to fight it together. And if, just, if you're going in here, you're going in the war together and fight together. You're going to die and bleed together. If they did that, I think we would have come out of that war with this country so much nicer country for everybody. And all of these gentlemen who return to civilian life and all the other distinguished members of this greatest generation, when they return to civilian life, they were determined to break the back of Jim Crow, and most of them did. So now we'll open the discussion up to uh, the audience to ask the gentlemen questions. Don't every oh good, Professor Tuttle. Thank you. <laughs> Um, most of these gentlemen are from the north, you know, Kansas and Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. Uh -huh. You mentioned that most of your white officers are from the south. How do you get along with those gentlemen? Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you get along with your white officers? <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> well, we got along real well. We <laughs> They stayed there. They stayed away from us as much as they could. <laughs> well, it, it actually, uh, uh, we went when we went up to the when we went to four forward positions. Some of them went back and left us up there <laughs> with our NCOs. Now we did have some uh, 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 black NCOs, but not many. Most of us all were privates private first class and everything like that and all the, and um, uh, the, uh, and I was in headquarters company, uh, 371st Infantry. I used to go down and visit with the, from a young man that was in D company. We, we, I didn't visit with him, but I went to that because uh, we headquarters always traveled around. This <coughs> <place>. uh, <coughs> but uh, we had to uh, learn, well, we learned to get along with with the white officers. They did, they did give us a real bad time. Now, my officer was Colonel Nolstein. Uh, he was the uh, regimental commander. And uh, the, uh, he was from Pennsylvania. But our, uh, the officer that was in charge of the, the, uh, uh, the general, uh, oh, well, I can't think of his name. It'll come to me. It takes a little while for it to get to me, but I'll get it. Uh, he was from Ty Ty, Georgia. <laughs> and uh, he ran uh, some of the people that, uh, I think it was G Company or D Company, one of them up there. These, they uh, asked for uh, air support, and he told them, let my buffaloes take them. We were buffalo soldiers. And they, and they, they got whipped up pretty bad. So, but. Uh, other than that, uh, I didn't have. To, I, I really didn't come in contact with him too, too much. First of all, when uh, Mrs. Danridge came down there, she was more like a top sergeant <laughs> than I had seen in a long time. Now she knows how to drill you and to grill you. And uh, she laid it on me, so much so that when she left, I went and sat down and went to sleep. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, she had some interesting things. But <clears throat> one of the things that I'd just like to say is that there, uh, uh, I, was, I was one of the dreaded 
DIs in the Army. DI was a drill sergeant, and he was a teacher, just like you all you high school teachers and everything in here. He taught people how to soldier. That's all he did. Now he used a little bit of rough language and so forth in doing it. <laughs> I didn't do that because I grew up in a home where you couldn't use rough language. And left with the idea from my daddy that if there was something to be done and it fell to me to do it, that I should be the best that I could be in doing whatever that job was. And so I took that into the Army with me. And you know, all of you gentlemen here know what we faced in the Army. I was trained from, from, from hard top soldiers, fellows from the 93rd Division, the 25th Infantry Division, used to be Buffalo soldiers, and they were career guys, and they knew their job. And I said, well, if they know the job and they could get it, I can too. And so it wasn't long before I knew every regulation in the book, R.A., and they called me Old R.A. <laughs> that was my nickname. Okay, so did it help me? Yes, indeed it did. First of all, it taught me some discipline, okay, which is not much of today in the schools, as you know, and we need more of it. If we wouldn't, we wouldn't have all this mess that we got out here. Now, and the next thing, it also taught me that because I was a little different color than other troopers, I'm American now, never forgot this, born and bred in the United States and Pennsylvania and went to school there and all that kind of stuff, barefoot and all that stuff, and I am truly an American, and nobody can ever dispute that for me. So if I am an American and I act American, I want to do the best for Americans and for my country. And so I learned this and practiced it. But now here's what happened in doing that. I found out that I had to be a little bit better than good. Just a little bit better than good. If the other fellow was good, I had to be a little bit better. And it paid off. Now all these gentlemen went through that, especially you guys who were in the, the, the Air Force. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. I was with them after you came back from Italy and after you went to Gardner. When you came to Columbus and was looking for a base, old gum was there. <coughs> I was there. I was in the medics. I was in, I was in the Army. And, and, and uh, I, was, I, was, I was Army serving with the Air Force. And uh, I was up at the hospital with Major Marshbanks. Many of you guys remember that. He was the yeah. flight surgeon that took care of you. I was there. Okay. You were good. You were better than good. And the record shows that. You never let people know that in doing what you did, you did it because you were American. We didn't know nothing else. We were Americans. We were born American from some other kind of heritage. So we did it for America. And we did it well. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmsley. I know all the guys that you knew. General, okay, Colonel Davis, General Davis, Major Blair, Chappie James. A lot of them are going on. Old gum's still here hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for inviting me to KU. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> My two daughters went to school up here. And I love this place, that's why I came. They went to school up here. Had a son, he went to Warrensburg, didn't stay long, he went over there and fell madly in love and got married, and that was the end of that. <laughs> they came here and got their education. Thanks thank, for inviting me. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yes, sir.
Mr. Adams? If I might inject this information for those who are interested in contacting individuals to speak for this Black History Month or anything connected with your particular activity at school, churches, or whatnot, the Heart of America chapter has a president here and many members who would be glad to contact you, give you the phone number and the individuals who you can talk to, our public relations officer, who would be glad to accommodate you with those who are still willing. Barring the cemetery or the hospital, we'll be able to accommodate you. So for those who might interest, it might be introduced to Mr. Ed King, our president of the Heart of America chapter, or our secretary, Mr. Jack Adams, I don't like to refer to him since we have the same name as John Henry Adams, Jr. Sure. <laughs> uh, but he is Jack and I am John. <laughs> and with those individuals, as well as our public relations officer, Mr. George Dun Dunmire here, would be glad to accommodate you and get those speaking arrangements that you might be interested in having presented at your particular facility. I take that information, hopefully that be of some assistance to you who might be interested. Senator Gooch. Yeah, I wanted to ask the gentleman that asked the question about school. Are you in Kansas or Missouri? Uh, right over the line in Missouri. Uh, well, the reason I ask is because uh, I'm a published author, and my book is in about a dozen of your schools, and I've been to at least that many that I have been invited to speak. Uh, so you'll find my book. Black Horizon in your libraries in many of your schools in Missouri, and I've been there and spoken to any number of your schools in Missouri. Maybe I've missed your school. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the one of the things of the common experience I noticed that, that all of you talked about was sometimes the tension that occurred between you and white soldiers, uh, and I'm thinking the times that you were embarking and growing uh, and going across the seas. There, any of you want to share the story, some of you who went across seas? What happened just before you left? Well, I can, I can, I, I can uh, speak to some of that. Okay. <clears throat> we left uh, our, uh, we, uh, uh, Peters, Petersburg, Virginia. Went to Newport News, Virginia. And, uh, we had a little altercation. Well, it was pretty big, and down in Newport News, we got in a big fight down there. And uh, when they got us all rounded up and got us all back on the on the base, the naval base, they put us on a boat, put us three miles out of the water, so we out in the water, so we couldn't get back. <laughs> we couldn't we couldn't get back. We stayed on that boat for three days until they got ready, got the convoys together, and. Then, then they, uh, and then they all we left, and we were on that on. Uh, I was on that boat for the same old boat for 21 days going overseas, and you wouldn't believe it. But uh, they were the reason why we was on the boat so long. They was ducking the submarines and things, and they'd go. Uh, we ended up we ended up back over on the coast of of England. And then we hit back France, and then we got back in the water, and then <coughs> finally we got got to uh, North Africa, Oran. After we hit Oran, uh, uh, we had a, another little get together. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't last very long because uh, see, they had given us our, our weapons then. We didn't have we, when we went overseas. We didn't have First went over, we were on the boat. We didn't have any weapons with us, and we didn't get our weapons till we got overseas. And that was one of the things that kind of was perturbing. And when <clears throat> the other thing, when we got ready to come back, when we got ready to come back, by uh, we were down in Naples. That's where we boarded down there, and uh, we. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, until we got drunk or something down there, we've gotten some pretty good fights down too in Naples. <laughs> I mean, that was overseas. We, 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 but the way we get home, you couldn't run, you couldn't drink all that water. You had to fight over, you fought over there, and then, then of course, we got back together, and everything went along fine. But uh, well, I would say so. And then when I got on the boat uh, 
to come home. They, uh, they broke up the 92nd Division. They, didn't, they wouldn't send us back together because I don't know what they thought we'd do, but I mean, they wouldn't send us. They broke us all up. And I ended up in the 3093rd gasoline supply of the, of the 99 Pursuit Squadron. Now, I didn't know a thing about that <laughs> gasoline supply, but that's what I ended up in. And, I, and, uh, the, um, and that's when they put me on the boat f from Italy. And uh, I was on the water. We was going to Pacific, and uh, they dropped the atomic bomb. Oh, I, was, I was out on the boat. I was on the water. They rerouted that boat back to New Jersey. And, uh, and then from there, I had to go back go to Fort Benning, Georgia. Are you sure there's water? Yes, there's water. <laughs> I went to uh, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, and that was where the real stuff was <laughs> going down. Now, I tell you, we went down. You'd go downtown to Columbus, Georgia, and you had to fight your way back <laughs> to, to the camp. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was kind of bad. But also, the other good, the good thing about it, though, was when they, when they integrated, uh, they, well, they sent me over. I ended up in the Air Force, Air, Army Air Corps. They sent me to Cheyenne. Closed the base by the name of Geiger Field. It was in Washington. And all the, the white troops that was up there, they came down and integrated with us in 1947. And I remember. Uh, this uh, my uh, roommate. Well, he was well. We had the b open barracks, and this guy, this white guy, come down to me and he put his hand on my knee. He says, "Oh, buddy," he says, "we <laughs> we gonna be bed, uh, we gonna be partners. <laughs> my beer's over here, and your beer's over." I said, "That's fine. Just have have yourself have at it." And we got along real good. He and he even invited me up to his house in uh, in uh, uh, Sheridan, Wyoming. So uh, I never did go, but, I, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, and then the other thing that I ran into uh, while I was in the service, now this was in the service, so I went, we were going to Montana to, to well, I, I, I became a truck driver. Not, I mean a mechanic, I was a mechanic. And we was going to Montana to fix a truck that had broke down in there. So we got to Casper, Wyoming, and they, uh, we had to stay overnight because the weather got bad. Well, I was the only black guy up there. And they, I said, well, I went over to the beer joint over across the street and I went there and I went to drink beer. And then I wanted to go find me a place to sleep. There was no hotel would let me, I mean, I'm in a military uniform right then. They wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, let me stay in the motel. So I had to, Sleeping, the, the, the sheriff said, well, said, I, I can get sleep in this cell down here. <laughs> 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 they, 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 that, that was in Casper, Wyoming. That was in 1947. <laughs> and I, I, said, I, uh, I said, well, the best thing I could do is so, I went, I went, he took me down there and he locked the door. I said, you got locked the door? <laughs> he said, well, he said, that's what, that's what we have to do, you know, that we have to lock all the rest of the prison. I said, I'm not a prisoner, but he said, well, that's, that's, he said, it's all right, we'll let you out in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, so those are some of the things that happened. It was really disturbing. And uh, I, too, went through uh, Cap Hat for Henry, uh, going overseas. Uh, I was part of the 1,000 Signal Company, and we were very fortunate that our officers were all black. And uh, at that time, uh, the only white officers we had were at the command level, uh, at the group level. Who was her job was to make certain that these uh, black officers and enlisted personnel are properly trained to do their duty overseas. So we we didn't really run into a lot of uh, racial problems. When we got up in Oscoda, Michigan, the base commander says, "Look, you guys like girls, so I'm going to have." So many African American girls in Detroit shipped up bus every weekend. So some of my friends married those girls. <laughs> so in, in essence, uh, our, we realized our job was to be prepared to <coughs> work overseas, and whatever skill we had was to use it in combat. 
And uh, when we, the only trouble we really had when we got to Cap Patrick Henry was the decision that they didn't want uh, blacks to attend some of the theaters. And you know, when you, funny thing, a lot of the blacks have been going to segregated theaters all their life, but now they're going overseas to give up their life. They feel like that they should get at least one, one evening to sit somewhere in the middle of the theater. And uh, as a result, thanks to, uh, at that time, Colonel V.O. Davis, uh, they made some adjustments and uh, they did let them in some of the theaters. But we were also fortunate, uh, we went over and there was a 33 ship convoy and out of the 33 ships, there was three of them were exclusively were black airmen. And I, I was part of, the, I went over on the William F. Few ship and uh, we were on ship for 33 days. And the only white people I saw were really some of the crew members uh, who were working on the ship. And we arrived in the, Toronto, Italy. We moved to uh, uh, Montecovino Air Base. This was an air base that had been operated by the uh, Italian uh, Air Force, taken over by the Germans. And then we bombed the Germans and took over it from them. And as a result, uh, except for the local townspeople, I, I didn't really see any white people. You know, it was a black organization and I just felt at home. Then we moved from there, we were in the 12th Air Force. And later on in uh, May of 1944, we were transferred from the 12th Air Force to the 15th Air Force, where we started doing bomber escort, fighter escort to bombers. And here again, we were uh, moved to a little place called Ramatelli, outside of Lusur, Italy. And we had a base that was all black. I just fell at home, no problems, no segregation, no <coughs> discrimination. We just <coughs> felt like what it was. Um, you run the problem though. I, I got a field commission. In those days, the, air, the military as a whole, they, they really weren't happy to appoint black officers. First black officer couldn't be over a white officer. First he couldn't give orders to white enlisted. So he was limited to what he could do. He had to be uh, over black people or black individuals. So when I was in Italy, I signed up for a commission. At that time, I had, at 19, I was a technical sergeant over a communications uh, group, a working group, and I went down and I uh, went before the board. Well, I realized this board was not too anxious to make another black officer, but at the same time, I was persistent. I never forget, I, when I got on a, uh, I was in Northern Italy and I had to go about 300 miles on a, in a truck and I, there was no newspapers, the only thing I could listen to was Axis Sally and she didn't give me what I wanted to hear. So basically, I saw Time Magazine and I read it from cover to cover. I never forget, I went before the board and on my way into the board, I stumbled into the room and I said, oh, I'm, I've lost this one. And uh, I, I, when I raised up, they were smiling at me. I said, I hope I fell amongst friends. And they started <laughs> laughing. And then I found the, the uh, head of the board was from Ohio State. And he said, you say you're a Buckeye? He said, you know anything about Ohio? I said, I'm, I'm Buckeye. He said, what did Ohio State football do in 1944? I said, they won the Big Ten Championship. And he smiled and I realized there I had a friend on the board. <laughs> And from there, I, I, I came back to my organization and uh, I couldn't have the same job I had as a technical sergeant, so they signed me another job. And uh, we, at that time, the war was getting ready to end. So we, major effort there was just to get the equipment back to the United States. But uh, as I say again, I, I always looked upon this idea of segregation uh, it's a part of life. The average white person, he's been segregating blacks all of his life. He's not going to change. And when I went overseas, even though we lost 65 airmen in combat, fighting, 65, losing their life, well, 65, <laughs> losing their life, I got the, got the list. Oh, lady. It, they, 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 they were fighting for what they believed in, and that's good. And I, I feel like a lot of the credit we should give now is to Harry Truman. When the war was over, the white 
officer says, look, you've done a wonderful job, but we're going to put you back in the, in the bottle. It was, even top commanders were, not, were reluctant to keep blacks flying airplanes. They wanted to send them back to, before that time. And once a person develops a skill and wants to do something, he, he doesn't want to change. But again, we owe a lot of a debt of credit to Harry Truman. In Executive Order 9981, 28th June 1948, when he integrated the military services. And it wasn't integrated right away. The Air Force had started. So actually, the services, uh, I got recalled during the Korean War. And at that time, I worked in a research and development group. And we had 300 officers. And of the 300 officers, only one black, Harvey Bayless. But, but everybody treated me well. They said, if you do your job, know what you're doing, I thought I did. So I was assigned to go to Korea from uh, the Rome Air Development Center. As a, I had an additional specialist. And I had to get to Hawaii, and I was also a radar engineer, and the radar there wasn't working. And uh, they had two C, uh, CPS-1 and CPS-5. And I got the radar working. And once I got it working, they said, well, we're going to ship you to, whole, ship you to uh, Korea. And the radar suddenly started going to blink. <laughs> <laughs> and after, after two times it went on to blink, they said, we don't trust this radar. We don't trust Bayless. We're going to get his butt to Korea. Well, while they were doing that, I went over to Pacific headquarters. And that time, I was only a first lieutenant. But I said, you guys need a gopher. You need someone that works well takes orders, doesn't ask questions, takes the bullet. So they said, you're our man. So I went into Pacific Division as the only lieutenant they had in the communication staff. And I set up ground air in the Pacific. And for two years, I, I, I did the job. Thank and you very much. Was. Thank you very much, Mr. Major Bayless and all the gentlemen up here. We certainly appreciate it. Their, their stories are so rich, in, and we've captured them. And some of them should be rated X, but that's okay. But they're very, they're very rich, but it gives you a sense of that past and that experience that no other officers, no other soldiers in the war entered. So we certainly appreciate it. And let's now resume to uh, the refreshment, and you can ask the gentleman more questions. Thank you.